Here's a blast from the past. In the front we have a Hitachi uh, TRK 8290E boombox system from 1981. Behind it we have a Hitachi TRK 8190E boombox system from 1980. These don't belong to me, they belong to a studio client who has several of these. Um, they're quite special to him for uh, nostalgic reasons. The one at the back is essentially new old stock and uh, it was quite expensive uh, for him to buy. It comes with the original packaging, uh, all the original manuals and everything, um, even a sales brochure uh, with it. And it has one minor fault. Uh, there's a switch on top which should allow you to switch on two or three light bulbs above the tuner dial and they appear not to work. Now given the condition and the lack of use of this uh, model I would um, hazard a guess that it's probably not the bulbs, it's probably the switch. But that takes us on to this model. This is the revised model, the 8290 from 1981, which uh, plainly on the front boasts metal compatibility. So the bias and erase circuits were tweaked on this revision, as were some of the styling and some of the colours. And um, this uh, was considerably cheaper for him to get hold of because it's a pretty well used machine. Um, it's very common on these machines that you need to do a belt replacement and a general service. So a full service is what this one is going to get first. This one only needs uh, this issue with the bulbs addressing and just a little bit of switch clean here and there and just a general check because he bought this under the impression that the belts had been done and it works fine but he just wanted me to double check everything inside it to make sure it's as it was sold to him. What I'm likely going to do is split this video into two parts. I'm going to work on the 8290 first because it does need a full service and clean. The tape deck uh, is not uh, operational, even the poor switch is seized. Some of the controls are quite sticky and scratchy. And um, it, uh, yes, it does need a full service. So. I'm going to do this one first because this will be the most work and that will be uh, a good practice because I've got a full service manual and everything for this. That will be a good practice uh, to then work on uh, the posh one which we'll need to, I'll need to treat with kid gloves essentially because uh, I don't want to leave a single mark on that. It is the chrome and everything is it's spotless and that's the way given the money you pay for it we want to keep it but this one we're going to restore this as much as possible so this is going to be stripped down and cleaned I don't want to lose this sticker on the front so I will take the cassette deck off uh, the cassette door off and uh, very carefully keep that aside but uh, I'm going to get a belt set for this and I'm going to completely strip it out and sort out a few of these seized up parts um, the heads on it are disgusting so um, we're going to go through that fully Restore that one as much as we can first. It's overall it is in pretty good used condition I would say. Some of the chrome's a little bit pitted and dirty. Uh, you can feel it there, that might polish up. Uh, there's not really any marks I don't think on the casework. Uh, just a couple of minor things, but overall it's been looked after. Great that it's got the sticker, um, but the tape deck's not functional and given its age, it's ready for the works. So I'm going to start with this one and uh, then when I'm happy with what I've done with that one and I'm more familiar with how it comes apart, goes back together, what's going on there, uh, I'm going to move on, likely in the next video, to uh, the 8190 to address this issue with the bulbs. Okay, hopefully I've got enough light on this. Um, unfortunately, the sun's gone down because daylight's a rarity in England. Um, but I've got my bench light and a, an ambient daylight lamp behind me that hopefully doesn't flicker unlike the light bulb above but anyway enough apologies let's begin so I have a full service manual as I said earlier for this and the first thing you have to do almost feels a little bit nerve-wracking you have to put your thumb underneath this uh, head cover here it's actually way below the heads but they call it head cover and you have to um, press it so that a little latch clears over the um, casing at the front there and then you can remove this completely and then you can eject the cassette mechanism and actually pop off the cassette door 
just like so. Not the easiest thing in the world. But if you're careful, you can finagle that out. So we can put that whole thing to the side. And instantly, if you don't want to take it all apart, but you just want to clean the heads, now we've got great access um, to everything there. And um, if you just need to, you know, grease any of the mechanism, perhaps the access to that is actually not too bad. So the next step is to actually stand the unit up. And the knobs on the top. Uh, can just about <laughs> just about get into shot. Um, all the knobs on the top we're going to remove. So I can already see a dial stream there. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that looks right. So all of these, yes, should just pull straight out. Don't need any tools for these. So all the fader knobs and the selector switches all have to be removed and I've read a warning not getting ahead of myself here but I've read a warning that when you're reassembling this uh, be careful to get the loudness button back through the hole before you completely push it back together um, because uh, otherwise if you catch that underneath and try and push the whole thing together you're liable to snap the stem on the button so you have to be careful that you align and I imagine these as well Carefully you align these before you close the unit fully. So I'm going to pop those um, in a jar because those are going to get washed. Now the next thing I'm going to do is lay down this spare bath mat because I want to lay the unit down on its front and I don't want to scratch it. So I'm going to very carefully set it aside. I'll notice I can hear some little rattling sounds as I move this around. So, something's up. Let's just look in the battery compartment. Oh, the this sponge. Yeah, it's seen better days as usually. Foam sponge on these things. So there's some dust in there, so I may replace that with something new. The battery springs look immaculate, so it doesn't look like there's been any battery leaks, which is good. We don't want those and. We have uh, all the screws to remove. The three on the back of this. I wonder if uh, the guy who owns this may have done that, may have marked it. I didn't notice if his other one's got a, a sticker on that, but he may have done that to identify which ones he's got. <laughs> I think he's got some more in his loft. Um, so we need to get these screws out. I have a couple of sets of JS screwdrivers here, because I imagine these would be JS at least. And uh, start removing these. Have I already done that one? That one was loose. That's interesting. So I've been doing this before me. None of these screws are particularly clicking when I open them, so when I do them, so I'd say this may have been opened. Oh, someone has been in this before actually because I'm noticing on the bottom uh, there is, if I can get that in shot possibly, can you see on the bottom there? The clip hasn't been put in properly. So yes, someone's been in this before. So I think one of those screws may have already been loose. Now lifting up from the bottom where the battery compartment is what it's recommended to do. And yes, that looks like that is. Uh, those two are for the antenna, so we shouldn't need to touch those. Okay, so I actually found it easier to completely remove the screws. Uh, there should be seven screws, don't just um, loosen them, but remove them completely. And after a bit of a fight, the back panel does come loose. Now I'm going to have a look inside this because there is some wiring. There is indeed some wiring, so. Uh, I'll see if I can try and get a shot through uh, from my point of view here 
to show you what I'm looking at and why you shouldn't just wrench the top off because this is really important. Now hopefully from here you can see what I can see is that there's a wire connected uh, right there and that is two wires that connect to the FM antenna socket and then uh, further around by the power transformer there are two more wires, I'm just going to turn this round there are two more wires here, you may not be able to see, unfortunately I misplaced my torch there's a blue and red wire which I reckon go to the battery compartment and to the transformer board there so if you just rag the back of it you're going to break these wires so let's just go back to the other side a second actually looks like they may be soldered on ah oh, no there's on the circuit board there are two spade connectors behind the rod antenna so they need to be pulled up so the white one goes to the right so let's try and that one that's it and the yellow one goes to the left that's it those are disconnected and same actually on this side now I got this wrong there's actually a red a blue and a black wire again I'll see if I can get a better shot to show you how that works so we have a, a red a black and a blue wire here and so the red wire goes to the right the black wire goes to the left and the blue wire is at the top and they're in a triangle and that should be sorry my hands in the way the entire back panel removed yes and look at all this interestingly you can still get those um, directly board mounted um, DIN sockets like that they're sometimes used for MIDI equipment it appears to be a sub assembly a kind of subframe that uh, some of the boards are mounted on and uh, yes the cassette transport as well so that's loose so it looks like to get to the transport this sub assembly also has to be removed and it looks like it may actually just come straight out the speakers of course are fixed to the front as are a couple of the boards so there'll be some more connectors to undo so I'm going to have another look at the service manual and just read up on that briefly this is why I really like to have daylight I prefer uh, to have daylight when I'm doing this they are actually marked red BLK for black and BLU for blue uh, on there and the red um, wire's got a, a rectangular tag like a spade connector the black and blue have got round connectors so there's actually less chance of getting that wrong because they're in a way keyed so and on the FM side there if you can see they are actually again marked uh, white and yellow and again they're two different sizes so um, it's a little clearer when you actually get the lid and the uh, wires out of the way that they are marked on the board so it's not too bad so it looks like we're able to lift this subframe from the bottom and actually you grab it from the corner as well and it does just lift out now it seems there are some cables at the bottom just here so there's actually a connector four pin connector that I believe goes to the speakers that looks like we can remove yep not the easiest thing but we can and a slight concern is a wire underneath that is soldered in um, where does that go and why that oh okay so that connects to um, a little board at the bottom which is a socket board I think it's the headphone socket it is there's a headphone socket board at the bottom that's interesting it's soldered to that and it looks like there's a screw holding it on from a bracket that you can only access if you move the subframe out of the way which is a bit, mm, a bit clumsy let's see if we can on that uh, let's try and loosen that from the top that's 
it. And then there's actually a little uh, there's a little flexible uh, retainer, like a cable retainer. You can just move out the way, and these there we go. These wires which sort of fit around this right angle shape will come loose. But that's odd that those are just soldered in and not um, also fitted to a, a jack. So let's just feel the dial cord there. Have a look at this, see what we've got. Okay. Might have to stand all this up. Wow, look at the dust on the felt. At least it's felt, as far as I'm aware, and not uh, foam, uh, which absorbs moisture and turns to acid, like in Moog synthesizers. Ask me how I know. And we have two small bulbs at the top. So these will be the bulbs in question we need to look at uh, when we look at the other machine. I believe on this one they do work. Um, there is a um, metal, uh, I'm surprised I said metal, but there is a metal um, tuning scale which is slightly bent. I wonder if it should be glued down. There's also a slight kink in it around here. So we need to be very careful with that. And there's also of course the tuning needle on the on the other side of this. I appreciate this is on the back, you can't see this ever so well. Um, let's see if I can get hold of the bottom of this and spin it around possibly. Ah there we go. So I just felt something go plink like a little piece of plastic or something like that that came out of that. Is that what was rattling around? It may be part of a little snap piece of plastic or something. I'm going to very carefully lay that down and have a look at this tape mechanism. Okay, switching to my other camera for a second, uh, I made an interesting discovery. Of course, I've just carefully flipped this over and and I've noticed that the um, seven segment display for the uh, program search system is in a socket. At least I think it's in a socket. It is. <laughs> to raise it up close enough to the front fascia, it's mounted in a giant, really tall uh, IC socket. So it comes straight out. That's incredible. <laughs> I'm going to pop that back in, but that's just really amusing to me. So if your LED readout doesn't work, check the socket connections. I have absolutely no reason to remove that other than sheer curiosity, and I'll clean the fingerprints off that before it goes back in. I can see a lot of dust and muck down at the bottom here. And I'm going to try and clean some of that out first, I think. Also, uh, I don't like the look of this much. Let me try and zoom in and show you. Just for a close-up shot of the transport, I'm not too keen on the look of the rubber uh, on that. So it's possible we may need to fit a new tyre uh, to this uh, take-up wheel. Um, it looks like, actually, it might be a rewind fast-forward reel. Um, there's a serrated grip on the plastic on uh, this pulley here, so I don't think it would be short of grip, but I just don't like the look of the rubber uh, on that wheel. It doesn't doesn't look great. So I'm going to give some of this a little clean, uh, and then I'm going to work out how to remove the uh, cassette the transport and see if we can get two belts at the back. Uh, we've got a counter belt on the front here which amazingly does still work. It's got a bit of a kink in it, I can see, but counter belts don't usually need lots of tension and it doesn't feel sticky. Uh, so I'd, hopefully we've got no risk of belts melting in this model. Uh, I think they're just dried out, but um, I won't know that until I get to the uh, two or three, I believe, at the back. So I'm going to try and get into that stage after I've cleaned some of this gunk out. 
I've had a real good clean up around this uh, switch assembly and this rubber roller I actually uh, again went around that with uh, just the same thing I just used a cotton bud and just some warm soapy water I don't want to get alcohol or anything on this because even with soapy water there's a lot of black coming off it it actually feels okay it's got a slight warp to it possibly but um, it feels soft enough um, it has cleaned up much better than I thought it looked in the first place but as I say I don't want to get alcohol on that but I have got the alcohol out now because I want to clean these disgusting heads there seems to be like a real murky film over them and then a little square in the middle where it's made contact with the tape um, so they've probably never been cleaned or someone sort of run a head cleaner through it yeah there's a kind of brown film coming off them it may be actually that they I might be wrong here, I might be proved wrong but it might be that um, these heads only have a polished surface where the tape makes contact but uh, no I would say they are coming up a bit they're going to need quite a bit going over yeah it's not so much it's not so much um, oxide or anything with tapers it's just baked in dirt certainly no smell of uh, nicotine or anything coming from this because you can usually tell when you get electronics from the 70s or 80s and they belong to a heavy smoker um, the tar all over everything can be uh, really troublesome but I don't get any of that from uh, this so possibly not uh, the pinch roll is an absolute delight again just soapy water uh, for this at the moment um, I have got rubber restorer sprays and things like that but I'm not going to jump to them on um, an unknown uh, plastic uh, or rubber whatever the, the compound is I'm going to stick with the gentle stuff first and obviously that is really working as I say it's not necessary to uh, strip the machine this far if you want to do this just as routine maintenance but as I have it uh, open this far uh, I just want to get the dirt out that I find on site so that I'm not spreading it further while I remove the uh, cassette transport and start flipping it upside down for the belts I just want to clean everything that I set eyes on and yeah that's coming up a little better just a quick one I've really done a number on um, that head I ended up getting a little tiny piece of brass out uh, and then cleaning it off with um, isopropyl alcohol again it's so much better you may notice as well one of these switches is looking way better than the rest I actually tried a little bit of um, Plastex, Meguiar's Plastex uh, plastic polish just very carefully uh, just to get some of this pitting out and it, I mean, it's still a little bit there but it looks and feels so much better uh, than it was so I think when we really get down to it I'm going to do the rest and get uh, this sort of horrible uh, feeling off the, uh, the buttons not pleasant. A lot of the controls have got this uh, kind of greasy feeling pitted surface on them. I think uh, these plastic controls, I think they're um, aluminium uh, vacuum, uh, not vacuum formed, I can't remember what the process is called, but rather than chromed, um, it's like an aluminium uh, vacuum coating. 
and um, I tried the plastics on them and it's really worked well. I was a little bit concerned that it might strip off any kind of paints or finishes um, but it's actually worked really really well and at the end of the day we have got others of these machines so if anything really does go wrong or if anything's really damaged we have got others to take spares from but um, I'm definitely going to do the rest of these because they've, uh, they've come up so good and they feel so much better as well after being uh, polished so definitely worth um, continuing with the plastics polish on those Excuse the quick handheld shot, but I've just noticed the ferrite rod is broken in the middle and this is the beauty of doing video. I was able to go back to the earlier footage where I unplugged the FM antenna connection and I realised that this was already broken uh, the second I took the back off, so it's not something I've done. Um, it's uh, a state that it was already in when it came to me. So this will super glue uh, perfectly fine, it does uh, it's a bit hard to do because I've only got one hand of course but um, it does go back together perfectly so one of the very last jobs I'll do will be to super glue the ferrite rod uh, back together while I'm in this area these uh, mechanical switches they're actually just mechanical levers that actuate a slide switch the rotary switch is not it's not a rotary switch basically it's it's not on the top and these um, pivots that um, actuate the switch um, they just sort of push on so if you flip the board upside down they just fall off and you might think oh no where has that come from it looks really complicated to get back on but it's actually easy it just loosely pushes straight back on on the other side there's one exactly the same um, that actuates that switch there again is exactly the same it just pushes straight back on there are two uh, little stems little pegs in the top um, top of the uh, the pivot there they go over a little peg might be a bit hard to see because the light perhaps you can see more on that side uh, yeah so there's two you can see there's two little step two little stems that go over uh, the little peg as you actuate that at the top um, it just pulls and pushes it so it's not difficult to get back on at all no panic all right, so I think time's come when I'm going to try and get this uh, deck out. And you have to excuse the noise in the background, the oven's on. Um, so I think it's just a handful of screws. I think there's four screws to remove. And that is, uh, well, not loose, but um, certainly didn't click. So hmm, I get the impression that's been taken out before. We take these screws out, just have a look, see if they are all the same. So I've got one out there. There's one here just under a circuit board which uh, has a ground strap on it so we need to make sure uh, that one feels tighter. We need to make sure that um, that goes back in. And so look not a magnetic screwdriver this yes it's the same as the other screw uh, I believe there's one here because there's a cutout and a circuit board for it again not tight uh, okay yep that's three the same and I think there is down here, it might be hard to see, maybe just be able to see it. There's um, a couple of cutaways in the metal and there's one in the plastic. There's sort of a plastic mount around the motor. And there's one in there. And we'll soon find out, but I think that is all the screws that hold the mechanism in. And it's just slid forward, so yes, that's looking like it is. All the screws. Uh, I'm not sure where that just went. Oh, there it is. Okay, this screwdriver is a tiny bit magnetic. And those four screws are all the same. So, again, I can't just wrench this out because of the wiring. But I'm noticing again underneath some uh, wire retainers, particularly on these red and black wires from the motor. So we'll need to finagle a few things I think. There's another one here actually, there's a flexible 
wire retainer here just wrapped around that I need to uh, undo. Get the screwdriver to uh, give me some slack. Ah, it's partly. Uh, in fact, I think there's a couple of ground straps. Oh, there's that wire retainer. I think is. Uh, it's got a tag on it and it uses that same screw hole so the actual ground strap is actually just underneath there and that's just come out so that's okay uh, that's gone in there somewhere that's fine it happened on video I know it happened <laughs> very carefully feeling my way around this to see what wire tension or anything if anything pulls it looks like I need to get that melt away from underneath that potentially. I'm just going to pause while I try and manoeuvre this around. Okay so I've had to sort of turn around the tape deck as carefully as I can because there's quite a lot of wires attached to it and I've just had to prop it up on a, a roll of masking tape just to uh, give it something to lean on but we can see the problem straight away there's the remains of at least one of the belts which is wrapped around the pulley and it has started to melt our worst nightmare so before I go any further I'm going to get a pair of gloves on I think we've caught that, it's tacky but it's not kind of too liquidy it's not like that Sanyo was I'm going to get some gloves on and uh, I'm going to deal with that one hand for starting and stopping the camera and one for work <laughs> that'll do so yeah I think we've caught this just in time I have an open bin beside me that I'm uh, disposing of the stuff as I get it but uh, oh yeah also this flat belt on top for the um, the capstan is very floppy so I'm going to move that out of the way because the whole lot's going to get replaced and this one underneath is yeah <laughs> they're all done so I'll put that aside so it's around this motor pulley then we have a real mess Let's see if I can scrape much of that out. I don't actually see any belt deposit anywhere else. That white pulley is very dirty, but I don't see any uh, any other belt deposit that's gone anywhere else. The other issue I have to sort out is that the rewind, fast forward, and pause are all seized. So while we're in the back of that, we will uh, get to that issue. But for now, I have to dig off all this. Uh, this horrible belt remains. At least it's quite a sizeable pulley with multiple pulleys on it. Uh, I once did a Hitachi boombox. There's a surprise present actually for someone once and the belts melted so badly that they'd actually gone down into um, one of the motor bearings and I had to um, dismantle the bearing and flush it out with acetone and then uh, re-oil it. That was a tricky one. I think... Oh, look at that. Yeah. That's uh, not too pretty. So it looks like there's a screw from the other side that goes sideways into this bracket that holds the flywheel in and that should allow me to remove uh, that belt in fact for the sake of speed I'm just going to chop that belt because it's done the flywheel is actually very clean and it feels fine all the pulleys feel fine that one's just quite dirty around the rim and then this I have to deal with. The acetone process begins and that's just the tiniest bit off the top. 
I should put a disclaimer in at this point don't use acetone on um, plastic pulleys um, in my experience nylon has been um, acetone safe but don't take my word for it I'm not a plastics specialist um, but ABS definitely is not and it will melt hold the front page disregard everything I've just said about acetone um, I have a kind of flux remover for cleaning the flux from circuit boards which has a kind of oily base to it and whereas acetone will eventually get you there the problem with acetone is it evaporates so fast that it doesn't stay wet when you're trying to use it on the cotton board as a cleaner whereas the kind of oily base on this flux cleaner um, kind of clumps up and gathers uh, the residue so much better like that's going to be such a saving of time So first of all, I don't think I'll get that any cleaner than that. And you may also notice I've got some belts on it. Now these are only scrappers. They're out of those sets that you get the multiple uh, big bag of them from China for a couple of quid. Um, they're only scrap belts. They're not the ones that are going to stay on it. Uh, I'm going to order a proper set from Germany. Um, but I've just dropped these on just to uh, link a few bits together and just check some of the tension and the good news is um, I've managed to free up the pause control and rewind and fast forward and it was um, kind of dry grease that's causing the problem let me see if I can get you a, a little shot in there so somewhere around here there is a linkage for the pause control and if I can try and do this um, it was sort of jammed and I've just freed it up you see it, there's a little bar pushing a little tab right where my thumb is and I gave it just the tiniest amount of GT85 just to see if it would free it up you don't ever want to lather these things with any kind of spray but I put a pipe on it and just gave it a tiny drop just to free it up I think I will need to take the flywheel out and um, clean and regrease the linkage properly. Um, as I said, there's a screw on this side that removes this bracket and then it slides off on this side, which I'll need to do anyway to get a proper belt on it. But um, I seem to have managed to free that up and the uh, rewind and fast forward now. They're a little bit clunky, but I think again, with some cleaning and a bit more use, I think we'll be able to free those up. I was a bit worried about that, that it was going to be uh, something all jammed up. Uh, kind of mechanically jammed but it wasn't it was just uh, dry grease that was seizing it up okay I'm back on the Hitachis um, it's been a little while since I've been uh, working on these because I've been waiting for um, belts to come and a couple of other things as well if you hear a bit of a buzzing in the background it's my new fridge because in the middle of trying to make a bit of video recently for this my old one broke down so <laughs> a new fridge has appeared um, yes, I've been sent some belts uh, from as a sample pack from uh, Deck Tech uh, on eBay that trade as Manatree actually on eBay. This is um, the guy who sent me the belts for the Sanyo before. I've gone back to these guys because uh, they were really helpful to deal with. And uh, this is not a sponsor or anything, but uh, they're UK based, really easy to communicate, deal with. Uh, Hitachi's are not in his database yet, so he went back and forth with a few measurements and he sent me a sample pack because as I've mentioned before the owner of this has got several of these and we want not only to be able to sort them all out and get enough spares to keep uh, to possibly do them in future but it's helpful with these guys to be able to um, confirm that a set of belts do fit and work well then they can put them in their database for other people who are looking for them. I was really surprised to find that for all the belt kits I could find for these machines um, the only complete one really for this model in particular, which needs four belts, 
was in uh, the USA. There's a kit in Germany that's only three belts. I don't know why, but it's only three belts. And most things online say, oh, they're all the same, um, including the 8190. Well, going over the service manual for the 8190, that takes five belts. And there are no five belt kits that I can find anywhere. So when we get to that one later, we're going to do the same thing. Um, can try and confirm uh, which of these are hopefully roughly about the same because he's given me the dimensions of these and uh, go from there to sort out an 8190 database um, but as for this 82 I'm going to take off these belts these scrapper belts that I put on which means I need to get this bracket back off so I want to get a shot of this screw that you have to remove at the side uh, in order to loosen this bracket and then you can take that off the others really easily just pull straight off the top so with four belts uh, on this model uh, we have a flat capstan belt which goes around the capstan flywheel um, a square section winding belt for a take up uh, reel and a square section winding belt for a fast forward and rewind and then on the front there's a counter belt as well so that's the four on um, the 8290 or at least this particular one I have been warned that some Hitachi stuff, um, despite having the same model number, uh, can um, vary uh, in the mechanicals of them. He says he's found Hitachi stuff which has got three different mechanisms all in the same model number. Um, hopefully that's not the case uh, with the 81 and the 8290. Um, the decks are not the same by far, they're massively different. You can see in the exploder diagrams if you compare the two even if you've never looked at an exploder diagram in your life you'd be able to see that one's got a lot more going on than the other and i definitely think that's because the 8290 has been understandably complexity reduced it's been engineered down a little bit the specs are the same it's just as good but it has fewer parts uh, i imagine these cost Hitachi a fortune to make and definitely um, what you see in that sort of move from 70s to 80s engineering whereas a lot of 70s engineering was um, let's throw as many parts as it, at it as we need um, by the 80s they were a little more um, concerned about our cost of manufacture coming out of you know an oil crisis in the in the late 70s and whatnot and also i think sort of cad and cam tools uh, computer tools for design and engineering and manufacturing improved and it became more feasible to um, look at parts and say well we need something we need three things doing can we make one part that can do it rather than three separate parts um, which of course cuts costs uh, significantly so they just got smarter about how they were engineering things i think um, throughout the 80s um, before things started to get you know really really cut price and the quality suffered but i think in the early 80s there was some pretty smart attempts to uh, improve um, products and manufacturing by reducing some complexity while still keeping essentially the same quality and specification anyway shut up and get this belt off so let's get this screw out now last time if i can actually tip this up i can here we go so there's a couple of screws on the side and the first time i tried this i removed the wrong one underneath this spring can you see that screw there that's the one that you have to remove and if you're careful you can do it with the spring in place it's not too difficult as long as you're careful to uh, to get that out but be aware you might drop this you might drop the screw or you might just get it stuck in the side so if you drop it Try make sure you keep your eye on where it went. In fact, I'll leave my pliers, I think, for this. Just take that out, set it aside. There we go. I'm just going to set that aside there. So you only need to carefully remove that one screw, and then this bracket. A little bit of persuasion it does wiggle loose. You only need that little bit of clearance, really. And it's out. 
I wish the Sonya would have been that easy. <laughs> so this has all been cleaned, so I don't think we need to do any other any other cleaning. I'm just gonna get a uh, I'm just gonna get a just gonna get a heavy roll of tape just to wedge in place. Sorry that's slightly off camera, just to just to hold that there. So see what we've got here. Some of those look very similar so I might have to go back to my listing just to see what um, I believed went where. So get this capstan belt underneath this little feels a little loose. The grip is okay, but it feels... I suppose it doesn't want to be too tight. We'll see how that goes. It seems to run smoothly and it seems to... I think stay fairly central on the hub. I'm going to put that screw back in. Obviously I will have to take this off back off because I've got to get the ones underneath, but I just wanted to get that under the bracket. So, here's the tricky part. Get that bracket back in, line the screw hole up while holding the spring out of the way. Tighten this back in, so I guess that's under that bracket. So, should be okay. So this fast forward and rewind pulley here, the black one, uh, is the belt that's longer and actually <laughs> it's a bit awkward where I'm sitting but looking at it from the top it's quite obvious it's further away from the motor pulley so that's got to be the longer one and it is the longer one, I'm just again, just check my note so we need to do those so looking at the heights that one actually goes on second so I need to do the take up pulley first so that's about the same diameter as the counter belt, it's not far off, but it's thicker. Uh, the counter belt's quite a bit thinner, so I'm just going to move this one a second. And so I'm right in thinking it was this one that had melted. I believe that's right. Just get the twist out of it, that feels okay, yeah, I'm not too tight, and then the fast forward rewind belt, which goes around the, uh, I think it goes around the bottom pulley, doesn't it, is that how it was before? I'm just going to look back at uh, some footage and some photos just to confirm. I can't remember if that one goes on the top or the bottom. No, it goes on the bottom, I'm sure. I'm not sure what that top pulley is for. Maybe this model is used on a. This pulley is used on another uh, model. It doesn't look parallel to the deck if it's put on the top. It's, uh, it just looks wrong. Again, a bit of a twist going on. So. Okay. So I think that's it for the back. I'm very carefully going to put this back together, and then I'm going to do the counter belt on the front. And real quick, I've just done the counter belt, uh, which is actually quite tricky to do because you've got to get the belt underneath the uh, counter and then pull it up. And get it around the pulley and this extends down quite a bit so um, you've kind of got to get the belt to defy gravity a little bit to get it around there but it's around there it feels much better than the old one 
and uh, it's a pretty thin belt as I say because it's got to have really low tension um, but that's it that's all the belts in so as far as I know everything's working now so I think I'm going to try and screw this back in and then try and stand it up and I'm not going to clip all the wires and everything back in just yet but I want to stand it up start working on some of the switches and stuff on the top row and then I'll probably try um, running power to it um, I'll probably put my power supply on it and just double check all the uh, features of the tape deck uh, in order to check that that is running properly okay you're not hallucinating the sun is actually out in England in November so uh, I've got a bit of a balancing act going on here because the tape transports back in this little uh, wire retain around here and threading the wiring back around the plastic clips on the chassis were really really difficult and fiddly so I did that off camera um, there's a tiny board down here that's got the timer switch I think it is and um, oh that's a timer switch what's above the timer switch uh, might be the record mute switch and the mic mixing pot and although that pot's not really going to get used that much I still want to take this board out and just a bit of clean because it felt awful uh, so this should I've taken the knob off the front so would one screw take it out oh there's another cheeky right underneath there's a little bracket holding another screw on which it's not easy to get to keep hold of this that's got it that's loosening it that one and this board, there we go, come straight out. So, yeah, might mix in socket and actually quite a bit of circuitry on there. There's a couple of transistors, a couple of diodes. So, there seems to be a little probably a gain circuit or so for, for that. Okay, so one of the brackets is that socket. Well, that's quite cool. Then it reinforces the socket, and there's the pot. So, carefully try and balance this back on. And yeah, that's okay. So I feel that part. Yeah, it feels a bit feels a bit gritty. So for cleaning the pots I have uh, this stuff. I'm not gonna do it with um, switch cleaner because switch cleaner is for switches, clues in the name, whereas this stuff is uh, plastic safe. And it's really for pots and sliders. It comes in this tiny bottle, so all the sliders are going to be done with this. And oh, there's a little bit of heat shrink in there. I know why I've know why I've put that in there. What I do is put it over the nozzle, and then um, I can get it through thin openings in uh, slider pots, which I might end up doing for these ones. So. I remember why that's there now. Um, so let's see if we can get a tiny bit of this in through the gap. Uh, I think I can go in from the bottom actually. And the good thing with this is it doesn't, you don't need a lot, but unlike a switch cleaner, it doesn't get in the oil of the uh, shaft too much that switch cleaner would just go everywhere that feels better I'm just in the process of getting the chassis back into the front case um, in order to try and test it and the fall and foul of something I wanted to point out is a grey wire here that's um, got trapped underneath the uh, record timer switch so I'm going to take this back out to get that off because this should have gone around the top here and uh, it's not, it's got trapped so just to point that out, be wary of that if you do take the chassis out these wires that are supposed to go under these clips when they're back in I think that goes there and there would have been I think, a retainer around there I think I've taken off I have to go back to my old footage but um, yeah that wire's got trapped under there, shouldn't be that way so just beware of these floppy wires when uh, you put the whole thing back together, it's not easy. 
So I managed to get that wire out of there without removing the chassis completely and um, as I touched on earlier in the video that I read on a forum somewhere that um, record mute switch I think it is on the top uh, whatever that button is at the top um, that sticks through that you have to be careful uh, to get through the hole yes it's really hard to do yes it's really easy to bend the um, the button and the switch if you're not careful it took me a few attempts to try and sort of get it right but it's there and it's okay so um, while I'm here I think I'm going to clean um, all of the slide switch mechanisms and um, I'm going to get my deoxit and I'm just going to give these all uh, a little blast on each side and I'm just going to get the excess out with a paper towel I don't want this to just blast everywhere Okay, I've actually cleaned the switches off camera with these, um, partly because the deoxid can leaks. They're renowned for leaking those cans, so I've kind of cut a holder, a cloth over the thing while I very carefully spray through the gaps in this to uh, clean the switches. I really ought to have done this um, when the chassis was out, but it's quite awkward to manoeuvre without. I might find a better way to do it on the next one. Um, but um, I'm going to do the pots with the uh, K loop and. Uh, yeah, I've got this little piece of heat shrink over the tube because I can squeeze the end flat, which means I can get it through the slots um, pretty easily. And you only need the tiniest dab, so it will go straight through, straight to the, the, the bottom track, basically, of the, uh, of the uh, pot. And you only need a really tiny bit. I'm surprised the um, bass and treble don't have centre detents, actually. They don't. Just something real quick that I've noticed. This, um, if you can just see under the wire, this is the red and black wire where the motor connects to. And if you look carefully there, I can try and zoom in on it. Um, this has been cut and resoldered. Was it even supposed to be soldered in the first place, I wonder? Um, because it looks like it has been removed and refitted. I wonder if originally they were on plugs and the plugs broke or something. That just seems a bit weird that there's cut wires hanging off the same terminals. Um, and then they've been soldered back on. That seems odd, I'll have to look in another unit to see if that's right, but that just seems a bit weird. Um, I'm not sure why that would be done like that from the factory, unless they were injecting the voltage to test the motor or something, then clipping that off, I, I don't know, that seems, no, that seems unnecessary. I don't know, that's just strange. It's just me and Radio 4. <laughs> Um, it's running off my bench power supply at the side there, the back isn't on it. I've put the case screws back in just to hold the chassis in place but they won't close all the way because of course the back panel's not there so the chassis does flop around a little bit. So I've been able to test the tape and the, the belts and everything are fine, they're spot on. Um, but um, yeah, the, with the mechanism going back and forward a bit, I really need to have it kind of bolted too properly before I can um, do a full alignment and everything on the tape deck. It doesn't sound that great. Um, I think there could be an alignment issue also. I'm not sure if it's easy to tell from there. If I go slightly off tune, the VU meters are slightly out of balance, so that needs correcting. And it's quite noisy on stereo FM, but 
to be fair to it, every FM radio I've had in this kitchen is quite noisy on stereo. It's one reason I switched to, to uh, dab in here, because the noise on stereo FM just drove me up the wall, and the reception wasn't that strong. Um, but yeah, um, we're getting there. Um, as I said, there's a few things to address and to line up, so. Uh, but every control seems to work, and um, that I've tested so far, I haven't found anything particularly wrong. Um, at one point I thought the um, tape deck had got no audio and um, nearly went in a complete deep dive of the circuit and must have spent about an hour going over a load of things then realised I was playing a blank tape so that might revoke my sound engineer credentials but um, yeah, just to show you around the back um, yeah, the back's off so I've just got a um, clip lead antenna just clipped in and the uh, the bench power supply and the clip lead is just connected to my the metal on my workbench just as a makeshift antenna for the moment. Um, excuse the stripes on the video, it's because I've got the kitchen light on because uh, it's not very bright outside again. But um, yeah, we're making some progress. So uh, I shall just keep going. I've looked out and I've found some white plastic spaces, some nylon spaces from uh, a previous project and it's just enough to uh, be able to put the screws in enough to hold the chassis properly tight against the front panel. That's exactly what I should have done in the first place so it's not slopping around anymore. So I've just put um, one in each top corner and then just these two central ones. The other screws are still in, so it's seven in total but that's just enough to hold the uh, chassis steady so I can stand it back up uh, and work on it better now. That's way better. 2.5 kilohertz minus 10 dB. Oh yes, I love this song. That isn't really 20k, that's a sub-harmonic, or probably a modulation harmonic that's coming through. You can't really get 20k on one of these cheaply duplicated alignment tapes. This isn't anything special at all. But I more or less just did that alignment by ear, then checked it on the scope and I've just given that a little tweak. That's um, that's not bad at all. Ooh, let's watch the sweep. Not off bad at all. One of the last things I want to do before I take these screws back out, super glue the ferrite rod and button it back up, is just tidy up some of this wiring because I went back on some of my earlier footage, as I've probably already said in this video, it's so useful um, to be able to go back over video footage. Even if I didn't put this up anywhere, it would be useful to myself. Um, I went back over this to see what this was like when I took the back off because some of this is just so sloppy and um, it was kind of already like that now I, I know we've identified that someone's been in this before because the bends in the um, the tuner plate and uh, the dial rather and a couple of other bits and pieces definitely indicative that it's had some work before 
but I suspect some of this was probably tie wrapped a little bit neater than it was so I'm going to go around and neaten some of this up. Wiring's tied it up, only took one tie wrap here just to get clearance on where the screw's going to go everything else sort of pushed back into the clips. Ferrite rod's been glued um, all looking pretty tidy, I think it's time for the back to go back on I need to reconnect the antenna and the power just something to note when you put the door back on Do you see this spring here uh, you have to get that back around it's not that hard but you have to remember to do it you have to get that back around the front of the door because it pulls the door back otherwise the door just sort of faintly flops forward but that spring has to pull the door back for it to work properly first couple of times I put the door back on I didn't do that and the action of it was rubbish um, and that's probably what made it quite difficult to get off in the first place because it kind of snags a bit on this corner but I've just spotted it and realised the, uh, the issue so I thought I would just quickly show you It's unlikely this is ever going to get used with batteries, but uh, I always like to get rid of that old sponge because otherwise it just tends to go everywhere. There's actually quite a nice feature I like on these where the battery door clips are actually two separate pieces of plastic, or rather the door and the clip are two separate pieces. and. It's moulded with a sort of stress point there, so in theory it would be really difficult to break these unlike the kind which are just moulded as part of the door and just sort of loop around this way which traditionally break off all the time. Of course that would have cost more to do it because there's two injection moulded parts there. But it just shows you, we talked about the cost of making these, that's a real nice detail but that would have come at a price didn't have to do that, but they did. with that I'm really happy with the uh, way the detailing all the controls has come out the belts for the deck are perfect so thanks to uh, deck tech Manatree for those I'll be ordering some more of those for the subsequent ones I've got to fix and uh, yeah really happy with this hope this was helpful to someone look out for the next video I'm gonna do for the 8190 because there are some differences and uh, we'll keep going forward from there so thanks for watching <laughs>